unfortunately, he couldn't make it. So uh, you get the alternate speaker, which in this case is me. Uh, my name is Ilanka Dunnan. I'm going to be speaking on steganography. Uh, this is not the same as the talk that's going to be immediately after mine, which is going to be on steganographic trojans. Um, my talk is going to be more about an overview of steganography, and I'll be covering some stuff about whether or not Al-Qaeda was uh, using it to hide messages inside of web images. Um, my own background is, uh, my, my current career is game design. Uh, I am a manager at a company that runs a website called Play.net. We do uh, many massively multiplayer online games. Um, so I've been doing that for over a decade, and all my, uh, my hobbies were in uh, solving puzzles. And I would talk at various game developer conferences uh, and uh, other fan conferences, such as at DragonCon in Atlanta, if anyone here has been to that. And since that would be part of the Electronic Frontiers Forum, I would um, you know, run into other people that were talking in that track, which would be people from the various 2600 groups and whatnot, kind of pass them in the halls. And so through that convention, I heard about a uh, puzzle challenge a couple years ago uh, that was, a, it was called the Freaknik Code. And it was a code challenge with the prize offered to the first person that could crack it. Uh, and it had been a year, and no one had cracked it. So uh, I heard about it through this convention. I, I was bored one weekend. I took a look at it, and I cracked it uh, in 10 days. And so I won you know, a free trip to the con and t-shirts and drinks and hotel and all that good stuff. Uh, since then, I, I've cracked a few of the other codes uh, that are put out as code challenges. As, as a matter of fact, I've cracked so many codes in SE 2600 Southeastern United States, as a matter of fact, that I'm no longer allowed to crack any of the codes that are posted by these groups. Uh, like the Atlanticon code uh, was handed out on a sheet, and at the bottom there was a little note that said, um, note, past puzzle crackers are ineligible for prizes associated with solving these codes. Give someone else a chance, Ilanka. <laughs> so uh, since I've got all this crypto stuff kind of fresh in my mind from cracking these codes, uh, after September 11th, uh, I did some other things. For example, I organized a crisis center where I was using some of my skills on the web to track down the status of every one of my customers that had been affected by the events of September 11th. Um, and I also cracked a hoax, like a, there was one guy that used September 11th as an opportunity to declare himself dead and then went around online pretending to be his own widow. Um, I, was, I was the one that figured that out, tracked him down, um, confronted him, got him to confess, got him to post a public apology and all that. Uh, if anyone wants more information on that, I can definitely give it to you. Uh, another thing I did after September 11th was I contacted the local FBI and I said, hey, I've got all this skill in cryptography that I've been doing now. Can I help with the war on terrorism? Is there anything, is there any way that I can be of assistance? I don't want pay, I just want to help. It's the right thing to do. And um, they said yes. And specifically, they said that they wanted more information about some of the newer cryptographic techniques, such as steganography. And they wanted me to come in and give an overview talk. Uh, in St. Louis, one of the things they do is they have a monthly computer crimes task force where they bring in representatives from all of the different agencies, you know, FBI, Secret Service, Assistant U.S. Attorney, Postal, Postal Inspectors, Customs Agents, everybody. And they sit down once a month and they share information, you know, trying to, to you know, ease the communication between all the different agencies. And then each representative from the different agencies goes back goes back to their regular uh, jobs and kind of shares that information. So I was invited to one of those meetings to speak on cryptography and steganography, kind of describe what it is and how it might be used if it's being used. And the talk that I'm going to give here is basically a version of that talk. Okay, let's get into it. Is this better? Okay. Okay, so um, I've kind of introduced myself. Uh, other things I'm going to be going over, I'm going to be talking about some of the cryptographic systems that I have familiarity with through the, the co-challenges. I'll be defining what steganography is, talking about its history a little bit, then giving some examples of modern steganography. Then I'll be going over something that I call the three Ds of defeating steganography, which is detect, decrypt, and destroy. How do you detect a message? How do you decrypt it if it's there? And failing that, how can you destroy a message that's there? I give a sample use of steganography, specifically in a code challenge that I wrote, which is a beginner code challenge. Uh, I call it the Alanka Code, um, and then a, a summary, and I've also got a bibliography and some recommended reading. 
Okay, um, I'm General Manager of Online Community at Symutronics Corporation, which was a company that, that I and the CEO got going out of an apartment loft. So we're one of the dot coms, and our, one of our claims to fame is that we're still here. Um, I've been, so I've been doing multiplayer games for over 12 years. I've been a computer hobbyist forever. Um, my dad was uh, involved in you know, early days of computers, like my father was on the team that launched the very first geosynchronous communication satellite. He used to work at Hughes Aircraft, and my mother's also a university professor. Um, you know, some people in the 2600 scene, I see a few people around the audience here that I chat with uh, via IMs, you know, and, and the crypto geek chick. Um, also last year I was the speaker at the first DEF CON girls luncheon, uh, which was hosted by Moloch, and I spoke on uh, how I cracked the freaknet code there. Uh, this stuff is not on the DEF CON CD. Uh, the slides will be on the Freaknik website. I'll be speaking also at Freaknik this year, which is the Nashville Hacker Convention. I have flyers up here, so after the talk, if anyone wants to come up and grab a flyer with information, feel free. Um, also, somebody gave me some mini CDs, which people, uh, he says that there's a, a Stego tool on here called um, Hide for PGP. I, I have not used it. I, I can't you know, give it a recommendation or, or a flame or anything, but if anybody wants it, it's here. It, there's a whole big stack of them here. Okay, um, so I was the first person to crack a, a, some of the Freaknet codes in the Atlanticon 2 code, and then I also mentor several people online on cryptography, and then they write their own codes, and I crack those codes. Um, and I told you about the crisis center and the hoax that I cracked. Yeah. Okay, so fact and fiction. The common knowledge um, was that terrorists were embedding hidden messages uh, in high traffic web images, like on eBay and on Amazon, and that they were passing them through public news groups, and that they were also swapping images in chat rooms and hiding messages inside those chat rooms, especially via porn. Again, this is what people were saying. Okay, for example, here's an article by USA Today. You know, we did this article, Terror Groups Hide Behind Web Encryption, and they have a sinister picture of Osama bin Laden there. Uh, Wired Magazine covered it, uh, Bin Laden, Steganography Master. Uh, the, the, also about secret messages come in waves. ABC News covered it as well. You know, a secret language. Hijackers may have used secret internet messaging techniques. Well, I have been researching the heck out of this and talking to many, many experts, and so far I have not been able to find a single shred of evidence that hijackers were using any kind of steganography to hide any message anywhere. If anyone has proof of it, if, you know, feel free to come up and tell me. I have, um, you know, I, like I've spoken to uh, Peter Rayner, who wrote the book Disappearing Cryptography. Um, I met him at H2K2 a couple weeks ago, and he says it's the same thing. He's traced it back, and he can find no proof. You trace it back, and he'll say something like, an official said, or a source said. Um, he and I were joking that uh, with my talk here, which has been going around the government agencies now, uh, it's also been forwarded around to D.C. It's going through the State Department, Office of Foreign Affairs, uh, Pentagon Department of Defense. And our, uh, Peter Renner and I, our concern is that somebody in government may be looking at my talk, seeing the slides, and not paying a lot of attention to what I said. And they may be walking away with a, a false impression and then saying, well, I saw some presentation that said Al-Qaeda was hiding messages inside of web images. So if you hear any more rumors on it, I'm probably going to be the source on it. Okay, I uh, will talk about what steganography is. Uh, I break down the, the words like stegos from the Greek stegos or roof, it means covered. And uh, graphia, which is the Greek writing, so it means covered writing. Uh, most people when they see the word they think of this in stegosaurus, which is a covered or a roofed lizard, not a type of cryptography. Okay, what is steganography? Okay, the definition is steganography is a way of hiding a message in such a way that it is not immediately obvious that there even is a hidden message. For example, in this sentence, after the theater, all clients keep a tab down at Wesley's Nook. Anyone see a secret message there? Very good, I'm impressed, very good. You guys got that really fast. Yeah, if, if you take the uh, first letter of each word, uh, and it's just very, very simple form, and you highlight it all, you do get a message that says, attack it, done. So um, we have captured some of the code books that Osama bin Laden's people did use, and we know what kind of messages they sent. Most of it was just open text and communication. When they did use a code, it was generally a very, very simple code. For example, we have proof that at one point when talking on a cell phone, and they wanted to refer to the FBI, they didn't say FBI. Instead, what they said was, food and beverage industry. Yep. Uh, if they wanted to refer to Osama bin Laden, instead of using his name, they would just say, the director. If 
they wanted to say bomb, they, they would use an Arabic word for baby food. And everything else that we found was basically just open text and communication. Again, there's no examples of them using steganography to hide message inside of any kind of a web image. Okay, historical background of stegon or, uh, steganography, cryptography. Basically, there's three main types of ciphers. Substitution, transposition, and concealment. Substitution being where you swap one letter out for another. Transposition where you move the letters around. And concealment, which is uh, where you're, you're hiding a message. So steganography is basically just a concealment cipher. Um, early examples. Uh, for example, about 2,000 years ago, Herodotus wrote about this. There was a general that needed to send a message across an enemy line, and he knew that any messenger he sent would be thoroughly searched. So he came up with the uh, interesting way of handling it, where he took a messenger, he shaved the guy's head, then he tattooed a message onto the guy's scalp, waited for the hair to grow back, and then sent the messenger across enemy lines. So the messenger was searched, no one found the message. He went and uh, talked to the king that they were trying to get the message to, could shave his head and just point his head at the king, and there was the message. Now, that is a, a very early example of steganography. Uh, invisible ink, you know, where you write one message in pen and another one was in lemon juice or onion juice or something on the paper, that's steganography. Uh, newspapers, it used to be when you were sending a letter uh, through the post, that you would be charged postage to send a, a letter. But if you were sending a newspaper, there was a loophole where sending the newspaper would be free. There was no charge to send newspapers through the mail. So of course, the you know, early hackers of that time figured out a way to use the system to send messages for free. They would take a newspaper and they would poke pinprick holes, like if they wanted to say, Dear Aunt Sally. They would find a letter D on the page, poke a hole under the letter D, find a letter E, poke a hole under the E, A, poke a hole. And that way they'd send the letter for free, no charge. The recipient, when they received the newspaper, could just hold it up to the light, see the pinpricks, and be able to read the message that way, no charge. So the methods have been changing over the years, but the discipline is basically the same. Okay, uh, these are some of the types of uh, cryptography that I've been running across when I deal with these code challenges in the hacker subculture. Uh, I won't go into all of these in detail, you know, lot 13, uh, anagrams, visionary ciphers. Um, I do talk about this, uh, there's some elite speak over here on the right hand side, which some of you are probably familiar with. You know, I am elite hacksaw. Um, basically, if I see anyone using this extensively, it basically means to me that they're a wannabe. Um, and uh, something else about codes that has really caught the imagination of the SE2600 group in the South e Southeast United States and other places as well, but it, it's really big in, in Southeast, is the CIA's Cryptos Monument, which is a monument to cryptography, which is at CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. And uh, it's been there for over 10 years, and there's a code on there. So far, we know that it's been broken down into four sections. Only three of them have been solved so far. There's a fourth section that hasn't been solved yet. Uh, but th there's been a, a lot of discussion on the web. And anyone who probably knows about cryptography has probably run into some mention of the Cryptos Monument at some point. Uh, one of my goals with my talk is I'm hoping I'll be invited to CIA headquarters to give my talk, and that way I'll have an excuse to go in there, and I can you know, sit on that rock and have a sandwich and stare at that sculpture for a while. I tried to get in there once. Um, you know, there's no street address for CIA, so I figured out where they were by using satellite recon pictures and looking for the outline of the building, and then I got the latitude and longitude and found it that way. But you know, when I drove up, about a lot of big guys with guns came out and wouldn't let me in. Okay, the Freak Week 3 code, um, this was released in 1999. Uh, I told you I cracked it in 10 days, won a free trip to a hacker con. Then I wrote a tutorial about how I'd cracked it. This is all on the web. Um, my, uh, I've got several websites. The easiest one to remember is elonka.com. So if you go to that one, I've got links to all of those from there. And the, and the, uh, the PowerPoint slides will be up there eventually as well. Um, and so I talked about all the different types of cryptography that were used in the, in the uh, Freaknik 3 code and how I kind of buried into the center of it. And I put in a lot of in-jokes, you know, cyberpunk, you know, counterculture jokes. Uh, I won't go into detail about how I solved the code, uh, but it had several different systems, hexadecimal, Route 13, anagrams, PGP, a pointer to a secret web page, steganography, red herrings, the whole bit. Um, and um, one of the things it did was it pointed to this secret web page, which was on the, um, uh, the freaknet.org website. And on this page were two pictures. And uh, one of the pictures was Johnny X, who's the guy who wrote the code in the, in the first place. And uh, he's I don't know if you can see it on the slides, but he's holding up a sign with a bunch of numbers. And what those numbers were were hexadecimal and then a long string. Hexadecimal, it stood for the letters ISBN and then a number. It was an ISBN number for a book, which was called Disappearing Cryptography, which was written by Peter Weiner about steganography. 
Um, and then this lower picture was a, a picture of Johnny X's girlfriend's stomach, and he wrote on her stomach the message geography ants, which is an anagram for the word steganography. Uh, and then in this top picture here, the uh, Johnny X had hidden a message using steganography with the password of steganography. And um, I was the first person to, to figure all this out and get to the center and then get instructions about what I was supposed to do next. Um, his instructions were, and, and he didn't assume that a woman would be the person to solve this code, but he's, I, he said I had to post a message to a specific hacker mailing list, which is the SE2600 root list, explaining why I like to go swimming with bow-legged women and swim between their legs. Um, I also had to post the message in haiku or sonnet format. Now, it, this was a you know kind of a quandary for me. I'd done all the stuff to solve the code, and then I had to write something like this. Anyway, um, I came up with something. Haiku, as everyone knows, the five seven five syllable format. So I posted a message saying, "Johnny X and I will discuss things aquatic if he wears a suit." And uh, that was how I announced I'd solve the code. It took him a month to respond and admit that I'd done it, but he finally did. Okay, uh, getting away from that, going back to modern steganography, messages can be hidden in images, in audio files, in videos, web page text. Can anyone still hear me with the playing game? Okay. Okay, um, for those who uh, are not familiar with cryptography and steganography, if you can have one takeaway from this about what it is, remember the phrase, polar bear in a snowstorm. Like if you ever saw a little kid in a school hold up a sheet of white paper and say, what is this a picture of? Ha ha ha, it's a polar bear in a snowstorm. Well, basically that's kind of describing what steganography is. For example, this icon over here where it says snow, this is actually the icon of a company called Snow Software, which, which writes steganographic utilities. It's something called white space steganography, which I think is really cool. And uh, if I open that image up with Paint Shop Pro here and I look at the palette, there's actually three different colors in that image. You can ignore all the stuff in, this, in the middle. And we're just looking at these three colors in the top left-hand corner, which is black, black, white, and white. So uh, why are there two shades of white? Okay, well, if you break them down further into what the RGB values are, black, of course, has an RGB value of 0, 0, 0. White has an RGB value of 255, 255, 255. Now this image has two shades of white, one of them being 255, 255, 255, the other one being 255, 255, 254. It's exactly one bit off from normal white. The, uh, the human eye looking at it will generally, will not be able to see the difference between these two shades of white. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change one of these sh shades of white to a different color. And now we'll see what the image was actually there, a picture of a polar bear in that snowstorm. Okay, uh, this can be used, uh, steganography can be used for many things, such as watermarking. Uh, there's lots of tools out there. It, you can hide it in pretty much any type of, of format. Uh, you can hide it in GIFs, WAVs, JPEGs, um, you know, picked files. Pretty much any type of file format out there, there's probably a utility to hide something in it with steganography. Uh, this is a, a page I pulled off the web that lists a bunch of steganography software. You can't really see it up at the top, but it lists all of these different uh, platforms. So you can select which one you want, Windows, DOS. Java, Macintosh, OS2, Unix, Amiga, you know, any, any, kind of, you know, any kind of system you've got, there's a freely available software utilities for it. Uh, this is just a picture of one called JSTIG. It's a very simple point-and-click interface. You know, hide a file in an image, extract a file from an image. Uh, this is one called JPHide. Uh, so you have the input file, the hidden file, the save file. You go up here, you can set a passphrase. This is one I use a lot called S-Tools. I think S-Tools is really awesome. Okay, so here I actually hid, in, hid a message inside of a picture that I pulled off the CIA website. Um, so here's the unencrypted image on the left-hand side, and then I hid something in it with S-Tools, and this is the image on the right-hand side. If you look at the difference between the two images, on this side, the, the uh, file size is actually 164K. After encryption, it's actually 150K. In this particular case, S-Tools actually shrunk the file size by the act of encrypting something on it. The color depth, though, that, that's really key. On this one, we have 156 different colors that are in that image. After encryption, 252 colors. So many, many new colors were added to the images while uh, something was being hidden inside of it. The password I put on this was mending wall, and I used the encryption type of triple DES. This is what I hid inside that image. It's the Robert Frost poem, Mending Wall, the one, you know, the good fences make good neighbors. Um, so if you look very closely at the image, you're not going to see this text. It, it's hidden you know, in different ways than that. If you were to highlight the bits, it would look basically like static throughout the image. 
comparing the palette between those two images, here's the palette before encryption, and then on the right-hand side, we get the palette after encryption. Specific things to look for, I don't know, again, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but like if you look at the number of whites and the number of greens, I've sorted by luminance here, and then over here, you get like a group of four whites, and you get over here a little group of four blues, and over here a little group of four ambers. And so what it's been doing is it's increasing the number of colors that are very, very close to each other, very close color pairs. Also, if I look down here at the black part of the palette, there's a black which is 0, 0, 0, and then the, the second blackest black is 0, 0, 1. So we're getting these colors that are exactly one bit apart, which is a big flag for me that steganography may be being used in that image. Here I hid something much larger inside of the, uh, the mending wall picture. So again, on the left we have the image before encryption, on the right we have the image after encryption, and at this point I tried to shoehorn a lot more data. I tried to hide a 100K file inside of it. So we see that the, uh, the color depth of this, we have 156 colors on the unencrypted image. The encrypted image, we have 256 colors, so it uses all the colors that are available in order to do this. And then the file size went from 164K up to 252K. So by putting more data into this container image, it's actually ballooning the container image larger. Uh, and comparing the palette on this, again, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but here we're, we're getting many more different kinds. We're getting a big block of yellows and a big block of eight different greens and a big block of eight different purples. So it's really expanding those very, very close colors. Audio files, um, you can do the same kind of things. Again, you're using the least significant bits to hold data. Um, there's also ways to transmit message, like maybe in the unhearable part of the audio spectrum. A uh, group, uh, Moloch, uh, did something where they encoded each musical note as a numerical value and then laid down an audio track in the background of some existing music. And that way they had an encrypted message there using the notes. Also, this is, there's a story that I heard at DEF CON, it was either last year or the year before, where somebody wanted to defeat cryptography export regulations. So they converted the RSA source code into sound and then broadcast it to foreign countries via radio. Um, okay, I don't think I'm hooked up for sound. I, I put a, a very small thing into a, a sound file. It's basically the, the sound of a phone ringing. I, if it doesn't come through, my apologies. It's not going to be something. Basically, I'm just doing this to show that there's no difference between the, the sounds. Here's a picture of the actual waves of the sounds. This is before encryption and after encryption. Uh, blowing this up, you can see the way the wave looks. Then after encryption, again, it's basically the same wave, but very, very tiny little one-bit differences in the wave. Messages and video files, again, you could do this by hiding things in the least significant bits of the data. There's also a lot of visual ways. For example, there was a lot of speculation about whether Osama bin Laden was hiding messages inside of the videos that he was sending, you know, because there would be like a video with Osama bin Laden and his lieutenants, and then shortly thereafter there'd be some sort of a terrorist attack somewhere. So they were worrying that there were secret messages being hidden there. It may not have been mistakenography. I mean, it could be as simple as um, hand signals. For example, blackjack card counters, when they work in teams, you have one person playing cards who's not counting, and then someone else is sitting across the table with his arms crossed who is counting and signaling the, the player. And the signal might be as simple as if his hand is here, it means bet high. If his hand is here, it means bet low. So you, you can do a lot of things with simple um, you know, hand signals. It could, there could be a code saying, you know, if there's a certain Al-Qaeda lieutenant sitting to Osama's left, it means something. If he's sitting to Osama's right, it means something else. I don't know. This is all just speculation on my part if they're doing this kind of thing. Um, eyebrow code, there was something in a movie where a guy was wiggling his eyebrows and a was sending a code. Vietnam POWs also had their code that they would use to transmit messages from one cell to another. For example, they would take the alphabet and they would put it into a five by five grid. So you'd have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, you know, and so five by five, I think they doubled one of the letters in the alphabet. So the letter C, if they wanted to transmit the letter C, since it's the third column over and one way down, and one, two, three, one, that would be the code for the letter C. And that way they could transmit messages back and forth between cells. Then if you get really good at that code, it doesn't have to be tapping. You can use other methods of communicating. For example, <coughs> you know, if you're coughing while you're standing in line, that would be a way of transmitting a message. Shuffling your feet, all, all different kinds of things you can do. 
Um, messages and web pages, the way that the data is arranged on a page can convey a message. White space steganography, for example, Snow Software, uh, they've got a really cool thing, a utility that will take a web page and then they'll insert spaces at the end of lines, one, two, or three spaces, you know, which is uh, holding the data of the message that they want to send. And then they, they'll get the page, read the spaces, and, and there's the message. Uh, Peter Weiner, in the new version of his book, Disappearing Cryptography, talks about ways to transmit messages in David Letterman's top ten list. Uh, there's many different ways that you could do this. A, a simple way might be each time the top ten list is shown, the, the jokes are still there, the content is still there, but say each item on the list, if it's an odd number of words on the list, that might be a binary zero. If it's an even number of words on the list, that might be a binary one. So each time you, you post the list, you know, you're getting some data across that way. You can also do things with verb tenses, active voice, passive voice, uh, sports announcers saying it's a long fly ball to left field. Or, but if they change that and instead of saying to left field, it's a long fly ball, you, you've got all these different ways of transmitting data just by rearranging words. Okay, so ways that terrorists could be using steganography potentially, like if they had a tourist information website, um, a sender would just need to upload a new picture to the site with something inside of it. The receiver would view the page. They wouldn't even necessarily have to download the picture. Just by viewing the page, of course, the image is in their cache, and then they could you know, open it later. Um, and there were several witnesses who did see Muhammad Atta, one of the terrorists who was routinely going to libraries and was downloading images, so usually pictures of children and landscapes. But then again, he was also fitting into the American culture. Um, again, we have no proof that any of those message, that any of those images had anything inside of them. Okay, uh, briefly, the three Ds of defeating steganography: detect, decrypt, destroy. Um, detection. How can you detect if something has steganography, is using steganography? You can look at the image's palette, as I showed you, look for very close color pairs, count the number of colors, uh, see if it has a suspicious number of colors in it. Look at the last modified date and size. If there's a web page where everything there was last modified three years ago and there's one image that's really new, that might mean something. Um, also, uh, differences in the types of images. For example, if all the images are JPEG and then there's one image on the site which is a bitmap, that might mean that they admitted it to be a bitmap because that was the utility that they were using. Um, Steg analysis tools, there's a few out there. One was uh, written by Niels Provos out of the University of Michigan. It's called Steg Detect, um, and it analyzes JPEG images. It's looking for the uh, frequency of the DCT, discrete cosine transform coefficients. Um, and I'll go more about uh, the, uh, you know, he, he did a, a very elaborate uh, collection of data on eBay, and I'll be going over that in a little bit. Um, Secure Stego, written by uh, Professor Jessica Friedrich in the United States Air Force, which is analyzing pairs of colors and images, and Stella, Steganography Exploration Lab. And I'm sure there's others out there, but these are just some of the examples, uh, examples of a few. Um, also, Niels Provost, though he wrote this program called Steg Detect uh, to analyze uh, images and find out if they're using steganography, then what he did is he wrote another steganography utility which could hide things in images that could not be detected by the steg analysis program that he just written. So it's a constant arms race. Utilities are written, ways are found of uh, locating them, and then the utilities are written, and around and around it goes. Uh, decryption. Uh, you can use a standard cloak and dagger on this. You know, you go out, you find someone who has the password, you, you buy them, buy the password or you threaten them or whatnot. You get the password, the location of the message, what the encryption type is, and what software they use, and then you open the message. Um, also, you can do these uh, password dictionary attacks. Uh, so this is my normal rant about picking good passwords. Usenix Security Workshop said that in any average group of passwords, at least no matter how many people are choosing good passwords, at least 25% of the passwords are going to be bad passwords that are susceptible to dictionary attacks. Um, and um, I use a program called Fast Zip Cracker. Uh, some of the code challenges that I solve, it's uh, kind of amusing because the people that are writing these code challenges think they're being all clever and they'll put in clues to a password and then they'll have a password protected zip file. And um, as soon as I see a password protected zip file in one of these code challenges, I say, heck to that, I'm just going to pop it open with FCC. And usually the people that are writing these code challenges pick bad passwords for their uh, password protected zip files. And they use little four character passwords. Um, so uh, you know, anyone that wants me to demonstrate this, I would be more than happy to you know, show how fast I can open a password protected zip file. You, you pick out like a simple four letter password or a four number password, I'll have it open in about 30 seconds. So better passwords are ones that use combinations of letters and numbers. Best, pa best passwords are really long but also use a variety of punctuation symbols. A, a lot of you already know that, I know. Okay. Um, 
So uh, doing a dictionary attack on images, there is a utility called Stegbreak, which runs password dictionary attacks on JPEG images. It can check between 15,000 and 112,000 words per second, depending on the encryption type. And then if you use a distributed dictionary attack where you cluster a whole bunch of computers together, you can, of course, go through it much more rapidly. Okay, so let's say uh, you're not sure about detecting it or decrypting it, but you want to delete anything that you see is there. Uh, there are ways to do that. You intercept the image, and then you can change it in some way. For example, crop it to a smaller size or change its color depth. Save it in a different format. If it's a GIF, save it as a JPEG um, or some combination of those. Those will probably delete any data that's in there hidden with, with their steganography. Not always. You, you have to play with it. I do have images where I've tried cropping them, and it did not delete the data that was in the image. I actually had to save it as a different format. But uh, most likely, these things will delete the, the data that's there. Steganography does have other weaknesses. Uh, of course, password security is always a weakness. Uh, to use it, you need to have a certain amount of technical literacy. Uh, you need to have computers. You need to have software. Uh, you know, so if you're out in the desert somewhere where you don't have access to power, that can be a problem. Doubts about interception. If someone's posting a message on a web page that's being viewed by 200,000 people, you don't know if someone else is routinely downloading your images and, and reading messages if they've already gotten the password. Messages need to stay small. Uh, most normal web images are less than 10K. So source files that are small, like a page of text, 1 or 2K, can be hidden pretty easily with steganography. But large source files, spreadsheets, diagrams, th those are going to balloon the container image size or may not even fit at all. Uh, audio files can hold even less. So fact and fiction. Uh, going back, the, the uh, University of Michigan did a comprehensive scan of eBay. Uh, they downloaded 2 million different images from eBay, and then they ran their uh, steganalysis tools on them, looking to see if they might have some sort of steganographic content. They identified 17,000 out of those 2 million that might have steganographic content, and 15,000 of those might have been encrypted with a program called JP Hide. That was the, uh, the signature that they found. So then they clustered 60 different computers together, did a massive dictionary attack, found nothing, zero. They did put some tracer images in there, and the tracer images were found OK. Um, but they didn't find anything else. Then they went on to Usenet. They downloaded 1 million messages off of Usenet. This time they clustered 200 computers together, and again, found nothing, nada. Uh, this is the uh, picture of the web page from the University of Michigan. Anyone who wants more data on this, I can, I can get you this info. Uh, now, there were weaknesses to the Michigan study. For example, they were only looking for very specific types of steganographic encryption. They were only looking for JPEGs. They were only looking for things that were encrypted with outguess or JSTIG or JPHide. They weren't looking for S-tools. They weren't looking at bitmaps or GIFs or WAV files. Plus, if terrorists are doing it, it's possible that the terrorists may have written their own independent applications, which would not be found by this kind of a, this kind of a study. Uh, and they only looked on eBay. They only looked on Usenet. Um, also, when they did their dictionary attacks, another weakness is that they didn't look for very many languages. They were only looking for English, French, and German dictionaries. They weren't looking for Arabic. They weren't looking for Farsi, though they did have some words in there that were f from the Quran. Um, also, it's possible that something may have been encrypted in there that had a really good password that was dictionary proof and just wasn't found. So it, it's, it's a possible. But again, looking at that using its security workshop research, humans being what they are, statistically, something's going to be findable. And the fact they found nothing, well, their conclusion was that there were three possible explanations. Either there's no significant use of steganography on the internet, or nobody uses steganographic systems that they could find, or all users of steganographic systems carefully chose passwords that were not susceptible to dictionary attacks. So I know there is steganography on the web. I've got two examples on my own personal website. These kinds of things were never found by the study because, again, it was only looking for JPEG images and not on major web scans. Um, oh, they did find one image. Uh, this was um, ABC News did a segment on steganography. And as part of the segment, they said, on this website, we have an image which has something in it which was hidden with steganography. And so the University of Michigan pointed their you know, machine over at this web page and, surprise, found an image that had something encrypted in it with steganography. Uh, the password on the image, ABC. So, yeah. Now this, is, uh, this top image is the, act is the image that was the cover image that was on the website. And inside of this image, they had this image, which was hidden, which was a, a satellite picture of some planes. 
Okay, uh, here's an, another example of stenography on the internet, the Alonk code. Um, I wrote this in February of this year. I used several different cryptographic techniques in it. I, I'm, again, I'm not going to go through it in detail. Um, it, so far, it's been solved by, actually, this is a little idea, but nine different people have solved it in seven different states so far. I did contact each one of these people and say, you know, you know I'm going to be talking to the FBI. Is it okay if I put, you know, your name up on a slide that's going up in front of the FBI? And every single one of them said, yeah, that would be really cool. <laughs> Okay, um, the Alonka code basically it decrypts to a password and the instructions. Go to my personal site and look for the image next to the FAQ question, why are icebergs blue? Uh, this is a screenshot of my personal site. Um, I went to Antarctica a couple years ago. I'm a, I'm a big traveler. I've been to every continent. Um, and I went to Antarctica in 1999 and then did a, a web page about, uh, <clears throat> about my trip with various pictures and FAQ questions. Uh, one page devoted to icebergs, and I had a thing about why are icebergs blue. This is a blue picture. There is one that I took back in 1999. And inside that image, I went and I hid something this year, which had a secret message inside of it. This is the secret message. I don't expect you guys to solve it right now, but if anyone wants to see it later, I'll show it to you. You can probably get in about 10 minutes. Um, okay, so where's taking out if we're going in the future? There is a, a new edition of uh, Peter Weiner's book, Disappearing Cryptography. Um, it just came out in May of 2002. If you want to get a book on steganography, this is the book I recommend. You know, he's, a, he's the expert as far as I'm concerned on steganography. And I did get a chance to meet him a couple of weeks ago. He's a very nice guy. Um, steganography will be used for things like music and video watermarking. Uh, documentation, for example, perhaps when a physician uh, takes an x-ray of you, they'll be able to hide the physician's notes inside the x-ray using steganography. That way everything stays together. Uh, Pixelvoy, there's been a discussion, like right, we have the Carnivore, which is scanning emails. Perhaps there will be some utility called Pixelvoy, which scans every image that goes through looking for something with steganography. But it continues to be an arms race. New utilities are written, new ways of uh, using steganalysis are written, more new utilities are written round and round. So, summary. Steganography is a way of concealing messages inside other media, such as sound files and graphic images. There are many freely available steganographic utilities which are out there on the web. Steganography is extremely difficult but not impossible to detect, and there are many anecdotal stories about the use of steganography on the internet, but so far no one has been successful, at least publicly, in running mass scans and finding any. Uh, I have some contact information. The uh, easiest way to contact me is if you're on AIM. My screen name is Ilanka. Yeah. Um, and I've got a lot of things on recommended reading and different articles. Again, I, I, I can send you this information or I'll, I'll be posting a link to it via the Freaknik site. I, I, again, I have flyers for the Freaknik convention which are up here and some uh, software CDs. <coughs> and uh, any questions? Uh, way in the back with the hat. Yeah, the question is, why didn't they scan the obvious sites such as embassies and the CIA and those things? Um, I spoke very briefly with Neos Provost online, and my understanding is that they wanted to have a very specific, quantifiable way of gathering data. And since there were lots of rumors about eBay and Usenet, that they'd go to eBay, they downloaded 2 million images, so it, it was a very focused, getting a very large sample from one location. Uh, black shirt. The question is, did the tracer images that they used have dictionary-proof passwords on them? I, I'm sorry, I, I do not know that. If, if I see Neil, I'll, I'll, I'll ask him. And then see if, if you want, come up and get me your email address, and I'll, I'll get you that information. Blue shirt. Yes, uh, when, how many people have noticed that there are some letters in the, in the presentation that were colored a little bit differently? Did anyone get any message out of those letters? What would you get? There, I'm, okay, I'm impressed. She got it. Um, there was a secret message that I hid inside my presentation. The way that I flagged it is that I, I had a uh, headline, and the headline was either bold or it wasn't bold. If it was bold, it was a signal that there were some letters uh, in the slides that were colored a different color. And you are the first, I, I've given this talk to a lot of people, and you are the very first person to actually get the message out of that. Um, so, uh, and the message that I heard was, anything they can do, we can do better. I'll get you a t-shirt or something.
I owe you a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. uh, any other questions? Uh, here in the black shirt. Um, my briefing will eventually be on the freaknik.info webpage. So at the Freaknik Convention, I'll also be speaking there. That'll be in Nashville. Um, and I'll also have a link to it from my own site, ilanka.com. Any others? Any other questions? Way in the back, white shirt. I'm sorry, I cannot hear a single thing that you are saying. Uh, something about the arms race. Uh, sorry, if you want to come up here, you can ask. Anyone else? Any other questions? Oh, wait, I have, I have some more flyers. Uh, we're out of CDs. The CDs are gone, but we do have Freaknik flyers up here. Anyone else? Are there are some more CDs downstairs. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.